What time is the spritz o'clock for you? <laughs> Every hour is spritz o'clock for us. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we're Venetian, so... Welcome to Ciao Bella, hosted by me, Erica Firpo, a travel journalist based in Rome. Each episode of Ciao Bella, I sit down with Italy's creators, contemporary artists and artisans, designers, culinary experts, heritage brands and innovative estites, and more who are defining and redefining 21st century Italy. Pull up a chair and join in. I am here today in the beautiful lounge of the Amman Hotel in Venice with Rudy Carraro. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and we're here to talk about, we're here to talk about an aperitivo that everybody knows and loves, but in particular, we're here to talk about Select. Indeed. So I, I'm pretty excited because um, I love Venice, but, and I love the history of Venice, but one of the things I did not know, and I am, and my friend Maurizio should have told me, my, <laughs> but, is that there was that Venice in 1919 produced an, an aperitivo, right? Yeah, 1920 to be precise. So um, 102 years ago. Exactly. So we recently celebrated the 100 year anniversary mm -hmm. and we did a collaboration with a uh, um, famous glassmaker in Murano to, huh. to create uh, a bespoke, uh, uh, let's call it bespoke calice. Okay, it's like a spritz glass, but more stylish. Really? Okay, it's more like not to be drink from, but you know, it's more like a piece of ornament for your house. It was actually, um, it was actually on sale at the Fondaco di Tedeschi for a while, for the whole year that we Who did it. Who is the uh, glassmaker? Uh, Salviati. Ah, I know Salviati. Yeah. Okay. So you know, we went for how, one of how, the top. How? Yeah. <laughs> is that how? <laughs> how? What? What was the difference? Because for me, a spritz glass. Okay. So I've, I've had spritz in many different kinds of glasses. So I used to live in Venice 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and I remember having spritz in like a kind of a flute. Mm -hmm. I remember having it in a plastic cup. Yeah. And more <laughs> recently, I think I've had it in like highballs. Mm -hmm. Oh no, in wine glasses too. Yeah. So what's, uh, what's the iconic glass that you guys made? Well, then Maurizio, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but the origin of the spritz started in a very humble way. Okay, so it was served uh, in, uh, we would call it like a tumbler or a rock glass, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the one that is used to serve the ombra. You know the ombra wine? I, I do, but I want you to tell everybody what ombra is. <laughs> uh, ombra, it literally translates into shadow, and is the Venetian term to describe a little uh, portion of wine, either red or white, that you can get at the bar. It usually costs no more than a euro, euro 50, and uh, it's just something that you drink if you're not into spritzes, basically. I heard, I heard that it's called an ombra because um, somebody told me, I don't know if this is mm -hmm. true, e poi devo chiedere a, a te, Maurizio, that the ombra is because when the Austrians were here, mm -hmm. uh, non potevano bere when the Austrians were here, and so they would drink in the shadow and they say facciamo an ombra, so okay. nobody would know. Yeah, basically there are different stories behind the birth uh, I mean, of the I, ombra. I, I, I might have made up a few stories myself. Oh, well. so. <laughs> that's, that's, that's absolutely fine, we're in Italy. Uh, you know, like the way, you know, there is different version of the Bloody Mary or the uh -huh. different version of how the Martini was born, uh, the term so it's Umbra, just uh, basically what I knew is that uh, uh, the, uh, the worker, okay, they were going around doing the, the refurbishing houses and palaces and buildings, they were always kept, uh, they were always keep their wine at the shadows of the clock tower, the San Marco, the company of San Marco, so it didn't get warm oh, with the sun. Okay? That makes perfect so sense. It would rotate uh, over the day, and <laughs> if you would find it, you know, in the shadow of, of the of the campanile, so that you could just, uh, you know, enjoy a not warm glass of wine. I like that. And it was small because you know people back in the days uh, still have to work. Yeah. So there's. <laughs> So that, that, that's how you were saying for the spritz, the glass, initially? Initially, yeah, it was, um, it, it, as I said, the, the spritz has a very humble origin because, as you mentioned, uh, during the end of the 1800, the beginning of the 1900, where Venice and the Venetian region was under the dominion of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, of course, the, the, the soldiers, let's say, uh, were going around the Venetian baccaros, as, uh, as you know, and they were asking for glasses of wine. Of course, they were not as fancy as we know them today. So they were going around for uh, uh, some ombras, let's say, but they would find the Venetian wine too strong or too acid, too high on ABV for them. So they would often ask the bartender 
to spritz in, to get spritzer actually, the glass of wine with some soda water from the siphon. That's why, <laughs> okay, basically, gespritzen means to spray in German. And uh, from gespritzen, then we basically, they shorten up the term to spritz as a nickname. And it was nothing more than a glass of wine with a bit of soda water in there, or salts, as you want to call it. And then uh, the evolution uh, continued because uh, we saw that the very first uh, recipe of the spritz with the bitter inside, and when I say bitter, you know, I mean select, mm -hmm. was, um, had the, the select was added around the 1950s, more or less, when a bar uh, a customer is walking to a bar and wanted the uh, spritz with a little bit more kick, a little bit more bitterness, okay? Okay. More or less like what happened with the Negroni, that the Count Camilo Negroni asked for the gin instead of the soda. Okay, here the customer just walk into the bar in a Venetian background, most likely, and ask the bartender to pick the red bitter that was behind him, aka select, and just add some to the recipe. Can I, can I ask a question? So you're saying that select, that, that's 40 years after a select was founded, pretty much. Indeed, yes. So, what, so were people just, did people just drink select by itself before that, or? Indeed, yes. Really? Yeah, basically, and there are still people that drink select that way. Uh, because uh, it comes from a long tradition of uh, how the Italian would drink during the aperitivo time. So if you go back in time, people would drink vermouth, rosolios, uh, bitter aperitifs, on their own, maybe with a bit of ice, if that was available, or maybe with a bit of soda just to give it a little bit more length and dilution. But the, yeah. We all know that you know the cocktails uh, scene came very popular around the beginning of the 1900, but we need to remember that that wasn't very popular for every right the, the everyday life. Okay, you know, it's, and it's, those are the kind of things that you know me as a 21st century cocktail drinker takes for granted. Yeah, uh, it, it can be it can be forgotten, but most of the spirits uh, and the liquors that, especially the Italian one, they were drunk just uh, on their own. Okay. So then in 1950, they said, hey, I want to, in the 50s, they're like, I, wanna, I want you to add a little bit to yeah. the spritz. Yeah. Just to spritz it up a bit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and then the bartender just grabbed the bottle and just went into, uh, just poured a splash of selecting to the recipe. Okay. Now, you know, we're not going to say uh, that the, uh, the spritz was the very first spritz of the history because I guess, you know, uh, other attempt and uh, recipe might be made uh, over, the, over the years, but it was definitely the birth of the Venetian spritz made with select. And then we need to wait until the 70s, so I'll give you a bit of the timeline. Wow, okay. Uh, we need to wait until the 70s because, as you know now, the spritz, the select spritz is very famous because it's made with the Prosecco. And we need to wait until the 70s until the Prosecco becomes uh, a more uh, popular wine. Until then, it was considered the wine from the farmers on the hill, away from Venice, okay, in the mainland, because yeah. Prosecco comes from, from Valdobbiadene. At that time, Valdobbiadene wasn't as popular as, as it is today. So we need to wait until that time, then, when the Prosecco started to make its way into the everyday life of the people, the Venetian people, it became, uh, uh, people realized that it actually was a very good wine, and uh, uh, slowly, slowly, it got swapped with uh, for the white wine into the recipe of the spritz. And uh, this is the moment when you have a more sparkly, more bubbly, more vibrant uh, recipe. Uh, select is not just a splash anymore, but it's like a uh, very generous amount, like two part in there. And you know, <laughs> since you lived in Venice, mm -hmm. uh, that they like it with a very generous amount of bitter in there. And uh, slowly, slowly then, uh, it became uh, the, the spritz that we know today. So. I'd love to know, because you very, very, very quietly said that Select is from Venice, 1920, mm -hmm. and it was made in Venice. So I think that's fascinating. I did not know that there were distilleries in Venice, that they were, you well, know, yeah. they were making, and I'd love to know more about that. Indeed. So the distillery of the Pilla Brothers was based in Castello area. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. I don't know why that blows my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so very downtown. And, um, I mean, is there even space for that? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'll surprise you in a second, okay? Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was based in, in Castello, and it was the, the hub where the Pilla brothers would produce uh, all the brands, 
of course, a select be main, uh, being one of the main one. And uh, then you might know Oropilla, which is another brandy mm -hmm. that was produced. Uh, and then we produce another uh, liquors and spirits. Uh, they opened the door of the distillery in 1919. Select uh, was uh, released as a recipe in 1920. So, uh, and from the very first beginning, they had a, a very uh, huge success because they were very proactive into marketing the brands. And they start with a very strong uh, advertisement campaign from the very, fir very first beginning. And uh, around the 30s, Select was very well known all over the region nearby Venice uh, and uh, also all over Italy as well. So it was very successful. Uh, then we have to remember that in 1933, the Littorio Bridge or the Liberty Bridge, as you mm -hmm. want to call it, which is the long bridge that connects uh, Venice to Mestre, to Mestre, exactly, right. to the mainland, was open. So Venice was a little bit more easy to get to. So a lot of tourists could come by train, by car, by bicycle, by foot if you want to. So it got busier. Before it was this little bubble where you know you really had to be a kind of privileged to get in there because of the boat and everything. And um, so it got very, very, very busy. And for this reason, and also because the business was doing so well, the uh, Pilla Brothers decided they wanted to relocate in a much more bigger, modern, and more productive production plant, which they built in Porto Marghera. Okay. Okay, during the 30s, 40s, Porto Marghera was the new high tech for the time uh, hub where uh, you know, the big industry would move, uh, still having the same uh, facility of moving the, the raw materials and the, and the, and the done product by water. Porto Marghera, Port. Yeah. Okay, yeah. is that an island? Oh, well, uh, no, it's, uh, it's on the mainland. So it's terraferma. It's terraferma, but, uh, but it's the very first terraferma that you find going to the and, mainland. And that, I mean, that makes sense because it's probably a bigger space and also logistically it, make, it made a lot of sense. You can move everything that you yeah. want via land or and if, via boat. And if anything happened, because it, it's easy, If because I could see that logistically being on Venice, if something happens... Mm -hmm. It's more difficult. Exactly. Mm. Uh, well, <laughs> funny enough, you mentioned if something happened, well, something happened for real, which was the Second World War. Ah. So in this very beautiful, uh, prosperous moment of the Pilla Brothers, uh, where they have the beautiful production plant, the business is doing great, uh, uh, Select is known all over uh, Italy, uh, that is the, the start of the Second World War. And because of the strategic position of Porto Marghera, it got confused everything, so all the warehouses. <laughs> so <clears throat> by the strategic position of Porto Marghera, all the warehouses uh, and the uh, hubs were confiscated by the Italian government to be used as a military base. And for this reason, it was a target that got heavily bombed <laughs> during the war. So the distillery, the dis distribution, this, this center, this hub, the was hub of select, gets taken over for the military, and then of course it's a prime target. Indeed. And did it get bombed? He, yeah, heavily. Mm. And the Pillar Brothers basically lost everything. But this is the turning point, because uh, here, here, uh, because during this time, uh, especially a smaller brand uh, that were uh, family owned or family produced as well, they died completely, because after the war, the owner didn't have the financial strength to rebuild everything. Right. But the Pillar Brothers didn't give up. So even with a lot of difficulties, they move to a safer area, which was Murano, which was, was a little bit out of the radar. And after the war, they start to produce uh, their products again, their portfolio. And you know, this is uh, really important for us because if the Pillar Brothers would have give up, we wouldn't have a select uh, exactly. anymore. So you know, an applause to them because uh, they fought for it. And um, yeah, and then they kept it alive, and that was fantastic. And then, as I said, the Group of Montenegro acquired in 1988. And uh, over the years, you know, from Murano, the production was really, really small. So now the production uh, uh, plant. Uh, is split between Teramo, where we are the first part of the production part yeah, of Select, and uh, uh, San Lazzaro di Savena, which is just outside Bologna, where we have the bottle, the blending, the bottling to you know basically the second part of the recipe, and uh, from there is where it's shipped all over the world. Um, so yeah, 
this is a little bit of the history of what happened to the Pilla brothers, the select brand, and how it came into the hands of Grupo Montenegro. But uh, since uh, we really love the, the connection that the Select has with Venice and with the Venetian people, we are about to finalize the new hub, the new home of Select, which will be called Ka Select, and will be open in September 2022 in Castello in Venice. No, you must be so proud. <laughs> we are very much. And uh, it's going to be like a visitor center with, uh, uh, of course, a select bar where everybody can enjoy a uh, select spritz, a chicchetti, Venetian style. And uh, the... You're bringing it home. Uh, we bring it home and we also bring into Venice uh, the production. No way. So we're going to bring uh, the majority of the production uh, back into Venice. So with all the herbs and the botanicas that everything, uh, with the, the, the recipe of a select is made of, and uh, we're going to produce it back in Venice. Congratulations, so, that's such a great story. Bring that's, it home. That's really, <laughs> yeah. really great. So we're very proud of that. So I have a, I have a few questions about, about spritz. Um, I was really happy when I tried a select spritz because I've never been a big spritz drinker for a variety of reasons. Bitters are not like my flavor, my, my gusto, like my, mm -hmm. but I really liked this. Like I was like, wow, I, I really, really enjoy select. Um, I really enjoy select spritz. Um, can you tell me like what sets it apart for you? Oh, well, there was a reason why select uh, became popular straight away from the very beginning is because uh, it really matches what is the, uh, for me, uh, the perfect flavor profile between bitter and sweet and uh, spicy notes uh, and ABV as well that uh, you want to find into your drink. Simple as that. Um, 30 different uh, botanicas is what we needed to create uh, the select recipe. 30? Yes. 3-0. And, and it's, uh, it's the same recipe from 100 years ago? It's the same recipe from 100 years ago. Uh, actually, we in 2018, we also restyled the bottle to go back to what it was the original one. It's, be it's beautiful vintage okay. looking. I love <laughs> Thank it. Thank you. I love the bottle. So um, we really went back to the roots of, of Select. And um, we're very also proud of that. And it has um, a very distinctive flavor profile. Uh, it's not too sweet. It's not too bitter. Uh, the ABV is right for uh, the aperitivo uh, moment, I guess. Can you explain to our listeners what ABV is? Uh, yes. Alcohol by volume is basically the percentage of alcohol that we find in uh, one liter of uh, alcohol. Okay. Oh, sorry, of, of spirit or liquor. And... Um, I can share with you the three main botanicals, if you like, yeah. of select, so we can go into the production process as well. Okay. Uh, let me start uh, with saying that uh, to make uh, select, we take nine months to make a batch of select, okay? Okay. Because as you said, we respect the original recipe from the 1920, from the Pillow Brothers. The three main botanicals that I'm going to share with you are juniper berries. Mm -hmm. So what we do with the juniper berries? we distill them. Okay, we macerate them first because you know that you need to macerate them to get the most out of it. So we macerate them and then we distill it. We, st we distill the juniper berry, which, which are Italian juniper berries, and we don't treat them in any way before they arrive to us. So we, uh, we have a very rich juniper berry with a lot of resin, with a lot of flavor, with a lot of essential oils. And this um, distilled, uh, we can call it a very basic kind of gin, if you like, <laughs> very sim sim simplified ah. gin, okay? Uh, because, you know, it has only, it's a distilled of juniper berries. And, uh, and this result, we use it as a base for our select aperitivo, okay? So we start with it with something that has already a lot of flavor in there. Then the second one is the Artemisia. Artemisia or absinthe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, because we need to have this very long, lingering, bitter finish to it. And of course, Artemisia is the king of the botanicals uh, to achieve this kind of uh, uh, flavor profile and death as well. By imagining you know, like Permut and, uh, you know, and the, the Chinato and all the others, uh, um, Italian Peritivo style, you know, 99% of them, they use, of course, Artemisia, also because it's very abundant in Italy. 
And uh, the third botanical that we use is the rhizome. I know you're confident with the rhizome. I don't know what that is. Rhizome is something in a very simpli simplified way, it's something between a root and uh, the stem at the body of the plant. Okay. So commonly known as ginger root, uh -huh. ginger is actually a rhizome. Ah. Because it doesn't really grow in depth, but it grows more like horizontally in okay. a very thin layer of soil. Okay. Okay. That's more. Well, that's a rhizome. Okay. Or like the oris, also known as oris root. But if you want to be specific, is a rhizome. Oh. In this case, our rhizome is a rhubarb rhizome. Does that also help with the color? Is that? Oh yeah. Well, no. Because you th <laughs> when you think about rhubarb, you think about the pink stem, right? That you yeah. use. Uh, you make like a rhubarb pie. Yeah. Kind of but it has that. It can be that. Well, I guess it's pinker, but it has that. Ri it has it's rich. It's a rich tone. Yeah, rhizome. We use it dried, and when oh. we macerate it, because you know, that means we, I forgot to tell you, but we boil it. So we do like an infusion. Uh -huh. We boil it, and we macerate the rhubarb rhizome. And the rhubarb, once it gets macerated with you know the solution of water and alcohol, it gives you a very, very, very dark color. Oh, okay. More like. Uh, like quinotto style. Oh, like that dark, like ruby brown color. Ru yeah. Exactly, ruby brown with that uh, amber yeah. hint, okay? Yeah. That's the color that comes out. Uh, and it's very thick as well, oh. in terms of color. So um, th then, you know, we have other... 27 uh, other. Other 27 <laughs> botanicals, which uh, I'm not allowed to disclose for the moment, but I'm more than happy to do so once you're going to come and... Okay, and, when, when, uh, I, when, I, when, when I come Cassel. to Cass Select. <laughs> exactly. And um, yeah, after nine months, uh, because we respect the timing of the maceration and the boiling and everything, we're happy to uh, put Select on the market. Okay. And, uh, you know, we could short a little bit up the process, but it wouldn't be like the original recipe. So we just want to keep it as it you is. You want to stick to a tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same things that happened for Lamar Montenegro, it's the same things that happened for the. Uh, Vecchia Romagna, so uh, we have uh, the um, honor to help this uh, very historical with a long heritage, uh, with a long history brands. Uh, so you know we don't want to spoil them, and we don't want we want to keep them as they were. If what's that? Expert? If it's not broke, don't fix it. Exactly. <laughs> now I have another question for you. Um, what do you think it is about spritz that has kind of captivated the world? I feel like you know, especially with lockdown, everybody started drinking. I mean, it was like spritz, 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 which is great. Mm -hmm, indeed. <laughs> but why, why do you think everybody loves a spritz? Well, because they now started uh, to drink it with Select. Ah, <laughs> that's a good answer. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Uh, to give an idea, the spritz phenomenon here in the Venetian area started around 2000, 2005, okay? And that's the moment when I was still a kid. Uh, that you know, so everybody drinking spritzes, okay. So, and for many years it's been only a Venetian thing. Then it started to spread all over Italy, and now, uh, as you may notice, the, the culture of the Ita Italian drinking culture has been exported uh, recently all over the world. Because as you said, everybody wants to drink spritzes. I think it's like what happened with Italian food and made in Italy back in the days. You know, people realized that there is a uh, je ne sais quoi, okay. There is the something uh, on plus that uh, makes it very appealing. Uh, might be the tradition, might be the you know the thought of uh, you know drinking a celeste spritz and imagining yourself in Venice. I don't know. I mean, it's the, I have to say, for me, it's the ease of like the end of the day, in the sun, see a friend, have a spritz. It's the easiest Perfect. thing to do in the Perfect. world. Yeah. So I have another question for you then. Well, let me let oh. me just close on that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and probably uh, also because. The whole aperitivo ritual was actually born in Italy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, now that a lot of Italians start to spread the word of the Italianity, uh, it's also easy to find Italian, real Italian products all over the world, like from uh, UK to US, uh, Canada, okay, uh, Singapore, wherever you are, you can really have uh, uh, a local store that says Italian products. And you can leave uh, the aperitivo Italian style, which is, you know, sitting down in St. Mark's Square in a little piazza or the little village or whatever. Um, and I, I think it's just like a beautiful culture that uh, people adopted and uh, hopefully they're not going to make their own, okay? <laughs> no, well, but, you know, it's beautiful to see that uh, 
the, the people love this style, okay? Because I found it just very relaxing. Exactly. And uh, uh, even though I'm around the world, it's like a home feeling when you sit down for an aperitivo. It sure is, and I think it, I think you're right. I think it's like, especially if you've been to Venice, you've had a spritz. You know, it's when you find when when you're able to to reproduce that feeling elsewhere, and then you're like, ah, I'm back in Venice. Mm -hmm. I'm back in Italy. Um, my last question for you is, how do you make the perfect spritz? We select, of course. <laughs> Venetian spritz or select spritz? Very simple. We use three parts of prosecco, mm -hmm. two parts of select, and one part of soda water. Okay. That can be omitted if you like it, uh, okay, a little bit more strong. Okay. But uh, I like it uh, because it gives a little bit more length, uh, and if you use like a very nice soda water, it gives a nice big bubbles that complements the bubbles of the Prosecco. What kind of snack do you like with it? Well, Cicchetti style, mm -hmm. which uh, of course are traditional uh, here in Venice. So like finger food, uh, which you can enjoy with uh, ease, I would say. I know that you know everybody likes uh, lasagna, but lasagna is not like an aperitivo food. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that would be horrible. Because, <laughs> but you know, let, let's make that clear because I saw uh, all kind of things you know going around the world uh, when people talk about aperitivo. Okay, but, no, no lasagna, please. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I would like to remember, uh, what I would like to remind everybody, is that we have actually a very beautiful garnish for our select spritz, which is uh, a large green olive. Oh. Okay. So, you know, see? Nice. So, basically, the tradition of having the green olive there, uh, sorry, the, the olive is there to recall the tradition of going into a bakker, so the Venetian bar, and having uh, your sal spritz and some cicchetti. So, you always drink and you always eat something, okay? And this is what is going to happen if you're around the world and you don't have the cicchetti with you. You always have, if the uh, spritz is garnished uh, correctly, you always have your olive where you can buy it on. And uh, most of the time, uh, the big green olive with the stone are kept in brine, uh, which you know, no bartenders bothers to wash the olives before put them into the glass. And which is absolutely fine for us because that kind of savory uh, saltiness that comes from the mm. brine completes the recipe itself. That's yes. it. So you got this umami flavor and uh, little uh, saltiness that really completes the recipe itself. Mm. So three parts prosecco, two parts salad, one splash of soda water, and a large green olive. That's how you make the recipe, the correct recipe for the salad spritz. What time is the spritz o'clock for you? <laughs> Every hour is spritz o'clock for us. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we're Venetian, so uh, after 11, we're good. <laughs> Well, Rudy, thank you so much for sharing Select with us. Thank you for being here and looking forward to share uh, more insight once we open Castellet. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Ciao Bella. If you'd like to know more about today's guest, please visit ciaobella.co and click on the podcast link or go directly to ciaobella.co backslash podcast. Want more Italy? You can find all my episodes on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher. When you have time, subscribe to iTunes and rate the podcast. What are you waiting for? And if you want to be part of the podcast, email me or DM me your Italy questions. To learn more about me and my work, go to my website, ericafirpo.com, and follow my Italy adventures on Instagram at ericafirpo. Ciao, bella! And a very big thank you and hug to Massimiliano Yonta, the producers of Ciao, Bella, who continue to make me sound and feel great. 